part of not paying attention. <laughs> so I, I hope you are all busily thinking of all kinds of things. <laughs> um, and we'll continue to do so during the talk. Okay. Projector warms up, but uh, uh, but go ahead, yeah. Okay, or the projector no, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. it'll come on. Yeah. Okay, good evening to everyone. It was it's really very nice to see you all here, and uh, this was kind of moment we've been waiting for the long period of time uh, to have the math lecture space and uh, I'm really excited about uh, that thing and uh, I would say that we are starting that era of math lectures in this space in the best possible way because uh, tonight as you know we have really mathematical superstar someone who is uh, promoting mathematics in the best possible way in every part of the world and that is our distinguished guest uh, Dr. Barry Sipra from the United States and I'm pretty sure that uh, almost everyone here who is not closely related to math after this math presentation will be much closer this wonderful science. Um, his talk, I'm not, not going to talk uh, about this uh, context of his talk. Of course, he'll present everything that is needed to be present. But I will say something about the title. And he's saying in a phrase of not paying attention. And uh, for me, as a host of uh, this month lecture, it's very hard to say you have not paid attention on uh, his talk, but this is something he would, as I understood well, he would appreciate, right? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. So there will be time for some math puzzles, for math games, and uh, everyone who wants to take part in that uh, math games is very, very warmly welcome to do that during during this lecture. So, Barry, that's my introduction. And I'm very, as I said, very pleased to, to have you here. Clever. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Okay, I'm situated okay for you. Uh, oh, it's just a wonderful pleasure to, to be in Montenegro to begin with. This is my first visit to this really beautiful country. Uh, just been having a great, great time. Um, and so I hope I can repay at least a little bit of the favor by giving um, a, 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 an enjoyable uh, uh, talk this evening. Although I'm, I'm hoping, I, well, my challenge is to get you actually to pay attention to what I'm saying, although at the same time I really, you know, hope that you won't. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I've, uh, back at the back of the room, I've got some puzzles that I brought along set up that um, anyone who can get to them is, is welcome during the talk to, to, to get up and, uh, and play around with. The, the genesis of this is that, uh, well, well the, the genesis of this is that I work 
as a mathematical writer, a reporter. Um, so uh, a small niche within science journalism generally. Uh, and so I've been to many, many, many math talks way over my head. And I find in, in many cases that at some point I'm just not paying attention to what the speaker is saying, either because I just realize that I have no chance of understanding it, or sometimes because the speaker is frankly boring. Um, and so I've, I've, over the years, doodled around. I just sort of find myself idly, you know, playing around with some mathematical ideas, most of which go nowhere, but a few of which have generated some interesting things um, that, that I enjoy sharing with, with people. And so I'm, I'm going to be running through a, a, a few things that I hope will catch your interest. Whether you follow everything in detail or not, I hope you go away with some ideas that there's something you know that I, that that was interesting. Now you know maybe what was it this guy was talking about? I remember it had to do with something like this or something like like that. And in the process of trying to recreate something, you may come up with something brand new all of your own. And that's really what mathematics is about, is coming up with, with new things. So that's what I'll be uh, presenting a few examples of tonight. Uh, first things first, though, I, I really want to thank uh, Vladimir for making this trip uh, so, so enjoyable um, and, and possible to, to begin with. Uh, it's, it's just been uh, it's just an instant good, good friend now. Um, a couple of remarks, because I've worked for the last 30 years or so basically as a journalist. I, I report on what other people do, and it helps to explain. I, I've been asked over the years, you know, what is it you do? And so I, I some time ago, came across a couple of nice quotes that explain generally what journalism is, is about, but, but they really capture the essence of what I do. The first is one from Lord Northcliffe, who was the founder of British tabloid journalism. And he said that journalism is a profession whose business it is to explain to others what it personally does not understand. And that's certainly been the case for me, trying to explain mathematical ideas that, as I say, are oftentimes way over my, my, my head. Uh, the other one comes from the British writer G.K. Chesterton. Journalist is a person who works harder than any other lazy person in the world. And I find that to be the, the case very much for, for myself as, as well. Um, one thing that, one instance of working hard as a lazy person is I, I can take a day off or an afternoon off and just read a novel and call it professional development because I'm learning, I'm still learning how to, how to write. One of the things I like doing as, as a reader is finding places where mathematics enters into literature in places you, you, you don't e expect. Uh, I haven't had any chance to, to, to examine uh, um, Journal, uh, uh, I'm sorry, writing of, of, of this region. But I did, some years ago, come across a book of poetry by an American poet, Sandra Gilbert, called Kissing the Bread. It was a collection of, of many of her works of, um, uh, or several of her works of poetry. Uh, the, 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 the cover kind of appealed to me. I picked it up thinking, poets often have little math poems. And I wonder if, if this uh, particular poet does. Well, she had a whole section, uh, a good number of poems, uh, titled When She Was Kissed by the Mathematician. And that was the title of one of the poems in, in this section. And it, it, the, the poem itself is, it is over a page long. I'm, I'm going to read just the opening couple of lines, because they, they, they really, I thought, captured this nicely. The morning after the night she was kissed by the mathematician, she woke with a new intelligence. <laughs> now, I asked my wife if that had been her experience. <laughs> she said she did wise up, but by then it was too late. <laughs> OK, however, before we get into some of the really fun stuff, the, the, this talk is 
hopefully all going to be just fun stuff. I, I do want to stress that math is serious business. Mathematics is really important for addressing many, if not all, of the problems of, of today. I mean, everything from finding cures for cancer, mathematical modeling is crucial, to addressing problems of climate change, to designing the next generations of computing systems and, and the interconnections of the, of, uh, of the internet and webs and World Wide Web and, and all that, to simply understanding what the universe is made of and where it came from. These are all places where mathematics plays a, a really, really crucial vital role. Okay? But it's also fun. And even that, there's a serious aspect to because it's through play that we master important skills. We know this to be true of small children, but it's really true of everyone, that having fun doing stuff is really helpful. In this regard, some of the, the, the models I, I like to you know, mention, Martin Gardner is an American uh, uh, math writer. He's really the best of the expositors of mathematics that, that ever, ever was, ever has been. Richard Guy is a mathematician who does all kinds of things. He's 102 years old now, still doing math at a level and a pace that puts many, most of us to, to, to shame. Uh, John Conway is quite famous for, for many things, including something called the Game of Life that, that some of you may, may know of. Princeton mathematician who, who will think deeply and seriously about anything that has a mathematical aspect to it. And younger uh, uh, and, and somewhat older, father-son team, Eric and Martin Domain at, at MIT. It's Eric is the younger one on, on the right, uh, computer scientists at MIT who just do all sorts of, of amazing, great stuff. So I, I, I recommend anyone to uh, look into their stuff. OK, that is a signal that I am going to escape into a different window. And let's start with. Um, a little topic on, on gray codes. Okay. So some of the things I, I, I will talk about are things that I literally came up with during talks such as this. Okay. Uh, but not all. This is, but, but, but almost all of these things are, are things that I kind of came up with when I was supposed to be doing something, when I was supposed to be working. Okay. But my mind got a little bit distracted and started playing with some mathematical ideas. Gray codes are, are named after an American Frank Gray, uh, the 20th century engineer, although they could have been named after a, a French engineer of the 19th century. Um, all they are is it's a way of listing all the n-bit numbers, just strings of zeros and ones of, of any given length such as, just for an example, the three-bit numbers, a gray code is a list of the numbers where each number differs from the one before it in just one bit. So it's quite common, it's, it's sort of standard to start with all zeros, and then you change one of the zeros into a one, and then another zero into a one, and, and then you go around, and if you look at it, um, and if you've looked at it enough, you can see that all eight different n-bit numbers, so, so really the numbers from 0 to, you know, this represents 7, 4 plus 2 plus 1, if, if, if you will. And it's done in such a way that when you get to the bottom, okay, you can change that final one back to a 0 and it wraps around, so it's actually a, a, a cyclic thing. Um, Here's another quick example for the four-bit numbers, because this is the direction I want to go with, with this particular idea. Again, you have 16 four-bit numbers. If we start with all zeros, we, we change a one, okay, we change another one. At some point in the middle, we have all ones, and then we get back down to a single one, which can, can wrap around. Um, it occurred to me to, to try to do something artistic with this. And if you're going to do art, you need a canvas. And I want to put four-bit numbers on, on the canvas. So 
first thing I'm going to do is divide it into four regions. And I'll do that diagonally, because I like diagonals more than, uh, I, I like things that are, are a little bit slant. And just for example, let's put all zeros in here. Now, to do something artistic, we need to color code this. And I also kind of like to do things in black and white because I, a lot of times I'm working on paper, you know, during a talk, I, I, I've got a notepad and I'm scribbling things and I have a pen, so I, so I have a white piece of paper and a black ink pen. Um, and since zero is nothing and black is the absence of color, let's just color each region with a zero black. And there we are. We have a work of art. Okay. So, well, you might ask, is it art? Well, I would say yes. You can go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and see a black painting that is worth millions of dollars. And I did one, you know, just a minute ago. Okay. Now, actually, I, I mean, there's a lot more going on in a, in a Reinhardt. So say the, the so say the people at MoMA. Okay, they, I don't think they would buy my work. But seriously, what I really want to do is put all the four-bit numbers into the 16 squares of a four by four array. So this is really what I, what I want to work with, and I want to uh, apply a rule for adjacent squares. Now, if you have two squares that are adjacent and you have all zeros, just for example, in one square, I want to get something you know, that in the next square that is only one bit different. That's the notion of a gray code, that when you go from you know, one thing to, a, to the next, you've only changed one, one bit. So here I'm, I'm going to the right. The rule I, I, that just occurred to me is, you know, I, I, I need a one, so let's just, the, 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 the thing that's right next to it, I'll flip that bit. If it's a zero, I'll make it a one. If it were a one, I'll make it a zero. You just reverse that bit, but then take the mirror image of everything else. So these top and bottom zeros will just be mirror imaged, and this far zero will mirror image to, to another zero. So it's like I'm putting a vertical mirror there, but it's a weird sort of mirror that, that changes anything close to it. So when you do that, that's what you get. And now, I want to do that, you know, I can, I can do it again. If there's a square here, I will ignore this. I'm just going to mirror image what's next to it with a little change. And likewise, I will mirror image what's you know up here, down here, with the adjacent toggle. Okay. The question is, is the rule consistent? Okay. And it is, I will assure you. But the, the, the question is, suppose I've so so I've I've applied the rule going this way, I've applied the rule going this way, but now I want to fill in the next square. There are two ways to get to it. I can either come from here, or I can come from there. And the concern might be, you might get different things. But you can see that you don't, okay? What you get is these, these you know, this zero becomes a one here, but this one is really just the mirror image of that up there. This one was a flip of that zero, but it's the mirror image of, of that one. Okay. So the rule is nice and consistent. Okay. And not everything in mathematics is. And, and in fact, there's a lot of interesting mathematics where the route you take to get somewhere gives you different results. Okay. But in this case, everything is fine. And if you do the whole shebang, okay, what you get is all the different six, uh, four bit combinations. And that is, you know, the rule only cared 
what happens when you go from one to the next. But if you apply this rule over and over again, out of it, you actually get something that is, it's, it's sort of like a gray code, just in that you know, things only change by one bit from one square to, to the next. But it's, also, it's very much like a gray code in that you actually get all the different combinations, all 16 of them. And now if we color code the zeros you know, as black, we get this. If we start cleaning it up and, and, and erase the ones, we get that. And if we remove the guidelines, we get something that starts to look like a, a, a rather nice little pattern. And you can notice that you know, everything black here, okay, and, and, and this whole line of white here, similarly, the bottom line is white, the top row is black. If you just kept repeating the, the rule, you actually just get this pattern over and over and over again. So you actually can tile the plane with it, and you get something that really starts to look like a nice little pattern. This is just made a little smaller so you can see more of it. In fact, this pattern was, was nice enough that it made the cover of, of Mathematics Magazine about 20 years ago, in part because the editor at the time was a friend of mine, um, actually a neighbor, um, and he needed something to put on the cover. Okay. Um, once I did that, I thought, well, you know, that was just one rule. Okay. So I thought of another rule, which is, this time, let's reverse, meaning, you know, toggle, flip, all the bits except for the extremes. So this zero is going to stay uh, 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 the, the, the same, but everything else will flip. And in this, so, this is what you get when you, when you do that, okay? This rule is also consistent. No matter how you, you, know, how you go about flipping you know, from, from one square to another, if you go a different route, you get, the same, uh, you, you get the same result. And this is what you get, except I made a mistake when I was preparing the slide, and it was easier to fix it this way. This, <clears throat> zero is wrong, okay, and, and that's just a, it, it was easier to fix it that way than to redo the entire slide. Um, when you color code that, you get this pattern. When you clean it up, you get that. And this one also repeats and tiles the plane and gives a pattern like, like this, which, okay, um, looks, whoops, this was the original, the, the, the first pattern, this is the second, and I'll just go back and forth a, a, a time or two. And, um, oh, that's, that's it, I'll, I'll leave you on, on this topic with, with a, a few things to explore. I've only presented two rules, okay, it certainly occurred to me there ought to be other rules. And hopefully some of you will stop listening to the talk at this point and start thinking about other things you might do that would somehow produce interesting patterns. And I, and I do want to stress, I had no idea when I started thinking about this that, that the, um, the black and white patterns that came, came out were as, to my, to my eye at least, as nice as they, they are. That was really kind of a revelation. Um, another possibility, I tend to work with square grids because they're easy to, to draw by hand. There are lots of other grids one can work with, hexagonal grids or, or equilateral triangles. There, there, there are many other grids. And there ought to be, it feels like there ought to be some way to do something with other um, uh, ways of, of tiling the, the, the plane. Random patterns may be even more attractive than these, these rigid rule-based patterns. Um, better color, somebody, there's gotta be something better to do than black and white, okay? Maybe not. Uh, or more colors, okay? 
I started with gray codes with zeros and ones, which suggested using things with two colors. But there ought to be something that, that one could do of an interesting fashion that uses three colors. Or, you know, well, there's a four color theorem. Um, but, but things like, like that. Okay. Um, I will go on to the next topic, but I certainly also invite people to interrupt me at any time with, with questions or, or comments or your own discoveries. Okay. And also, again, anyone who can get to them is welcome to, um, to, to play with the, 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 the puzzles. And that's what I'm about to go to now. Um, this next thing is something I call the Sal the Wit problem. And it's one of the, the, the puzzles in the back of, of the room. And it came out of a book that I, I picked up in a used bookstore about 20 years ago. Um, Sal Wit was an American conceptual artist. He was one of the minimalists. And he did a lot of art that has very strong geometric and combinatorial flavor. And that's what this book has plenty of examples of, um, and, and one in particular. At any rate, he's known for monumental wall painting, such as, as this, where, and, and hopefully you can see you know, the strong geometric um, aspect to it. This was in the Metropolitan Museum in, in New York again. Um, another more colorful example with a big black blotch on it, which maybe is sort of a fractal uh, type of pattern. This was a, uh, a line-based pattern at the Whitney Museum that I uh, actually saw a few months ago. Um, he also worked with sculptures that have strong geometric aspects to them. And he did lots of combinatorial things that we'll, we'll get to. Here's another sculpture. Uh, one more, I, I, I hope these are cleanly, clearly visible, uh, public artwork, and I'll swear to God he was the <laughs> architect. He's not. Okay. But when I saw that building yesterday, I just had to add it. Okay. Uh, okay. He also did lots of drawings and, and etchings, uh, some in color, again with strong geometric themes to, to many of them, some with random, uh, somewhat random squiggles. And then in this book, there was this etching called, okay, called um, uh, Straight Lines in Four Directions and All Their Possible Combinations. And so if you see, in fact, uh, let me go on to the next slide, because I've redrawn it perhaps a, a, a little stronger. What he has is starting across the top row is he has a vertical, uh, I'm sorry, a horizontal, a vertical, an up and a down diagonal. And then across the next row and a half, he has their pairwise combinations, things two at a time. Again, preferring the horizontal first with the vertical, then the up and the down diagonal, and going all the way to the two diagonals. And then the um, four combinations where he has three things at a time. And then finally, all four. And then where in the original slide he had the, 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 the title, at least in the, in the book, it's sort of natural to say, well, you can also not have anything. Okay. Right. What caught my eye when I looked at this, this book, and I was just thumbing through it, and, and you know, came across the page with colorful stuff on, on one side and, and this puzzle on, on the next. Um, and you know, I, I, I understood Saul DeWitt's logic in the way he laid out the squares. But what clearly caught my eye was that some of the lines continue from one square to the next, but don't make it all the way across. Okay. But a few do. Here's a diagonal that starts at one edge and actually makes it all the way to another edge. Here's another diagonal that starts at one edge and makes it all the way to another edge. Here's another one right here, an easy one and, and the one up there. But 
But then there are diagonals that, that, that don't make it all the way through. So the question just occurred to me, okay, again, looking at this book when I should have been writing an article and, and, and trying to make some, some, some income, um, was can you rearrange these? Oh, incidentally, this is something I, I, I just drew for, to, to give these talks, uh, removing the, um, the, 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 the lines that just shows the horizontal, vertical, up and down diagonal. And it has a considerably different aesthetic than, than you know, that version. That um, it, it has a kind of a cryptic, runic quality to it, I guess. Anyway, the question that occurred to me is, well, could you rearrange the squares so that all the lines actually make it all the way from one edge to another? And what I did was I got a piece of paper and cut out a bunch of squares and drew horizontals and verticals, and, and that was a chore in itself, to make sure that I got all 16 combinations and then fiddled with it for about 10 or 15 minutes. Fortunately, did find a solution. Um, but here's an example where, you know, let's just kind of randomly start moving things around. But now I'm going to, I've just completed one horizontal. Okay. And now I'll complete a vertical and now I'll move this guy in here. I, I, I literally, when I was preparing this slide, just put things in places where I thought maybe they'll, they'll, they'll go. But you can see the next piece just has nowhere to go. Okay, perhaps you can see it because the horizontal line, you know, there's, there's no horizontal line in these. Okay, there's no horizontal line, in, so you, you just can't fit it anywhere. Or for that matter, the vertical line, just every column where you can put it lacks a vertical line uh, in it. So this is an example of, of an attempt to solve the problem that gets stalemated. Okay. But it was in part because I'm, I'm just randomly moving things around. I would invite you to make your own and try it. So just cut up a bunch of stuff. You can see these dots here are, are the, the recommendation for them is they anchor things to prevent you from rotating uh, the, the things. Because if, for example, you rotate a horizontal, it be, you know, if you rotate a horizontal, it becomes a vertical, but you've already got a vertical. The, the original thing started with a horizontal and a vertical. And now, again, you can do whatever you want. Okay. You don't have to do what I say you should do. You don't, you, in fact, you know, anything I tell you to do, you should think, let's do the opposite. Or, well, of course, I just told you to think about doing the opposite, so good luck with that. Okay. Um, okay. If you rotate pieces, you know, you know, you, you, you have duplicates of some pieces and, and not of others, but who cares? Okay. Maybe the additional freedom of rotating pieces makes it easier to solve the puzzle. On the other hand, you know, if you allow rotations, then there are so many more possibilities to explore. The haystack just gets enormous, and maybe it's, you know, there, there, there may well be interesting, there may well be interesting solutions with rotated pieces. Okay, I've, I've, I've yet to succeed in getting someone to take this seriously, um, to, to actually look for, for, for stuff that, that um, is different from what I do. Um, uh, you know, there may well be solutions that involve rotate, rotated pieces, but the haystack is so big that they may be rather difficult to find. Who knows? Okay. But, okay, if you, at any rate, I, I do recommend uh, uh, making your own and giving it a try, or in, in the back of the room by the, 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 the puzzle uh, thing, there are some sheets that are already printed out that you are um, uh, welcome to take. 
I hope there are enough for people who are interested. Or, better yet, have a friend make you one out of wood. My friend is a mathematician named Lauren Larson, uh, who is also a master woodworker. And, he, and, and this is his wooden piece being uh, attempted by a couple of students. This is what it looks like, and it's what's set in the back of the room. Okay, um, and you know it's it's just a lovely thing to uh, to to have. Um, okay, um, incidentally, okay, because you've got all the combinations, if you find a solution, you can rotate it. You can you can rotate the board. And you've still got all 16 combinations. And you can, of course, rotate again and rotate again and rotate again. Not only that, but you know, whatever you do, you can also, not literally with the wood, but with a photograph, you can flip it. Okay. So there are <coughs> geometrics, you know, simple geometric symmetries of rotation and reflection that preserve. Any, uh, um, uh, uh, what is it? Any solutions that, that you, you you come up with? Okay, so that helps in some of the the, the, the thinking, but it, it doesn't necessarily help in finding the solution. Um, now at this point, I'm I'm tempted to not show. Should I show you no. the solution? No, please. No. Okay, then we're going to stop right there. Okay, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to cut over a bunch of stuff. I will show you instead, and then we'll go to, to, to the next topic. Um, uh, whoops. Okay. When Lauren Larson made this wooden puzzle for me, he also invented his own puzzle with a similar idea, okay, uh, that I call the Lauren Lewitt problem. And in this case, <coughs> I'm not going to explain, in part because I have trouble un understanding it my myself, but Lauren's idea was again to get 16 pieces in a 4x4 four four array. Um, but in his case, what he does is each piece has two rays that come out from the center that either go to a midpoint of an edge or go to a corner. And he has something in mind that gives him a complete set of 16 possibilities. Okay. Now, I'm going to kind of leave it at that for you to puzzle over your, your, yourselves when you try to remember what the heck you were, this guy was talking about. Because it's actually a little challenging to take this basic idea of you know, two rays coming out of the center going, you know, uh, well, you know, some of them go to two midpoints. Like, like, you know, these diametrically things, or this one here that's at right angles. Those, these two are at, at, are at right angles, but then some of them, um, you know, some of them go to two different corners, like here and here. Some of them go to a midpoint and a corner. Um, there's a little challenge in, in figuring out exactly what rule Lauren Larson had in mind to come up with what he considers a complete set of 16 pieces. When I looked at this, I, I, I was really puzzling over it myself. Okay? And, and I had to go back to Lauren to have him explain to me what he had in mind. Because when I you know, counted, you've got eight corners, or, or eight points where you can possibly go to. Okay, four corners and four midpoints. You're choosing two of them. And for the mathematicians in the audience, there are eight choose two ways of doing this. And that turns out to be 28, not 16. 
that Lauren had some way to reduce the, the, the set of 28 down to a set of 16 that was still in some sense complete. And so the, the, the puzzle I'm going to leave you with on that is to figure out what in the world was he thinking of? He does have something specific in mind, I, you know, but, okay, the real thing I want to get across, I, I hope to get across, is you don't have to do what the speaker does. You don't have to do what Lauren does. You just have to, to think there's something that can be done here, and if you can come up with something on your own, it might actually be even more interesting than anything I've spoken about. And in fact, it certainly will be uh, more interesting because it'll be original. Okay. Anyway, Lauren, you know, does he, he came up with this set, and he now, you know, this is. I think not a solution of whatever puzzle he posed. I, I think what he wanted with, was whatever he's got with the pieces, he wants to make you know, a nice, single, simple, you know, closed curve. Uh, and, and this thing has a little tail and, and so on. But who knows again? Okay, you've, got a, you know, you've got a bunch of things that you can move around and, and, and arrange into hopefully interesting fashions. Okay. Um, since you didn't want to see the solution, I'm going to Excuse skip. Me. Yeah. Yes. I'd actually like to see a solution, please. So maybe people who don't want to see it can simply look away. Close their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> would, would that be possible? Yes. Part of it. Part of it. Okay. All right. So, yes. Let's go back to the solution, or where I was about to give the solution. Okay. And those of you who don't want to see the solution, okay, right. And I, 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 I do. I, I am excited to, to show this because <laughs> it took me longer to get keynote to do this than it took me to, to find the solution in the first place. So nobody watch. And actually, you know, even if you see it. It won't help you. <laughs> hey, there it is. Okay. Now, if you really don't want to see the solution, okay, there's that solution with the with the grid lines. Okay, and now there's an unexpected bonus to the solution. And now I'm I'm, I'm not even going to speak here because for anybody who really you know, really wants to explore this on their own, I, I strongly encourage you to look away. Okay, so everybody, is everybody happy? Did, 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 of the ones, uh, of the people who are watching, did you see that or should I do it again? Okay, let me, let me do it again. Okay, let me do that. I'll do it one more time. Mathematicians have a name for this property, and again, I'm not going to speak it, okay? Mathematicians have this fancy name for it, okay? But everybody knows what, what it is. Okay, um, and let me get out of that. So is everybody happy with either seeing or not seeing the, the, the solution? <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay. How much more time do I... Uh, okay, no, all right. I'm going to jump to, um, whoops, uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump to a, um, a couple of variants. The, the, once you have the idea of, you know, uh, 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 take something that's got some logical structure to it, and then see if there's a problem in it that, that, it, that is along the same lines of something you've already done, generalizing things. This is something I, that I like to call the circle the wit problem. And I hope, I, I, I hope it's, you can see enough of it um, in, in the darkness. What I did was instead of doing you know, horizontal, vertical, up and down diagonals, I either do or do not draw a quarter circle 
centered at the corner of a square. So you know, like in this square here, I've got a quarter circle from this point and a quarter circle from this point, but I haven't drawn the quarter circle from that point or, or from that point. So across the top row, I've got the four different corners okay, with a quarter circle drawn, and then I've done the pairwise combinations, and then three at a time, and then down here I've got all four corners have a quarter circle, and then in the bottom I've again left it blank. And here the, the uh, condition that certainly occurs to, to one is try to rearrange things so that you actually have complete circles. And you know, so here you almost have a circle, but you know you you don't have it there. So again, rearrange these 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 uh, things. Um, here it is without the the, the guidelines. Um, the next one that came up with just a few years ago, I, I'd like to call the sine of the wet problem. Okay, it's a variant of the sine of the wet. Um, uh, and the, the question here is to rearrange things to make sine waves that go all the way from edge to edge. So again, uh, what I do is I either, on each edge of each square, I either do or do not have a half a sine wave, which also looks almost indistinguishable from a, from, from a different type of quarter circle. And you can see, for example, there's a sine wave here that you know continues from one square, but it's missing its last little link there. Here's a yeah, here, what's a nice one. Well, let's just take here's a sine wave that goes halfway up, but doesn't make it there. But if it did, it it would continue all the way to the to the top. So. This is also printed up on some purple sheets that are sitting on the table over there, ready to be, to be cut up and, and, and played with. There it is that um, uh, where I've tried to remove the, 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 the guidelines. For this, okay, and this is an example of something that I should have, it really should have occurred to me a long time ago. Um, but it only occurred to me when I was preparing this talk where I was, you know, decided well, I'm going to tell people about the, the gray code patterns that I came up with. And I'll tell people about the Solowit and the Sinolowit problem. And it suddenly occurred to me that these two gray codes that you, you recall from, from a little while ago, okay, one of them actually is a solution to the Sinolowit problem. So this is just a little hint, okay, and you'll have to make of it what you will. So it's either that's a solution to the sine Lewitt, okay, or the other way. One of the two gray codes, okay, turns out to be a solution. I'm not going to say which, okay, because it's more fun to, 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 to figure it out on your own. If you can remember, you know, anything about gray codes or anything about sine Lewitt, and if you can only kind of half remember things you've heard about, okay, you may have a good chance of coming up with something even more interesting than, than what I've talked about here. Um, let me, I'm, I'm going to skip the, the, the oh no, I, I should just do that. Um, are there other interesting math problems in other works of art? Okay, there certainly are, or, or I think there, there certainly are. And, okay, even more interesting, I think, is can you turn math problems into interesting works of art? And I, and I dare say that's a challenge as, as well. Okay. Um, do I have time for one more? Or? Okay. If I don't, okay, if you've got dinner waiting or, or something, you're, very, you're, you're free to leave. I'm, I'm not um, uh, insulted. Uh, when, when people, uh, you know, get up and, and, and leave, only if they um, say something. <laughs> it's real <like. laughs> um, Okay. I'll talk about one, this one final thing, I, I, I think. Um, and this is the other wooden puzzle that's, that's in the corner that I hope people will maybe take a, a look at. Something I call the bricklayer's challenge. 
although it is also called building barricades. And I've, I've come to like this name for it more and more because it might be my one shot at having my name associated with a piece of, of mathematics. The, the, this is named from Richard Guy, the, the centenarian mathematician from, from earlier. I also like to say it's, I'm no Gauss. If you are familiar with your history of mathematics, Carl Friedrich Gauss was one of the famous and most important mathematicians of the, the 19th century. Um, and it begins with the story of Gauss, who it was said as a school child, okay, um, his teacher gave the class a little busy problem to, that, that um, uh, would hopefully just, you know, give him a little peace of mind for a better part of an hour or so. There, there are lots of versions of this story. A common one is that the teacher told the students, add the numbers 1 to 100. Okay. Whatever the actual problem was, it was something like this. And, and this is the version that you, you'll hear most, most frequently. Okay. Well, the story of Gauss is, and this is apparently a story that Gauss, as an old man, liked to tell people. Uh, although he, for some reason, never specified what the problem was, or nobody remembered what, what he might have said it was. Anyway, Gauss, as a 10-year-old, okay, was already you know, a brilliant mathematician. He apparently instantly saw an easy way to get the answer. Okay? And it's not known exactly what he did, but one way to do it is, well, write the numbers backwards you'll certainly get the same sum. But if you do that, you notice you can combine 1 with 100, 2 with 99, 3 with 98, all the way down. And if you do that, okay, whatever they sum to, 101 that many times, will sum to twice whatever the sum is. And consequently, 101, you've got 101 a hundred times. And that'll be twice whatever the, the actual sum is. And consequently, the sum is just 101 times 50, or 50-50, okay? The story, as Gauss told it, was he, he, he didn't write down any of this stuff. He just saw it without, almost without thinking. He simply wrote down the answer 50-50 on his little chalk tablet. Okay, and, and slammed it on the teacher's desk and said, lick it, Zay. There it is. Okay. And the story goes on from, from there. Well, a, a, a friend of mine who writes a computing column for, for one of the science magazines in, in the States was collecting some versions of this Gauss story, including versions of, of how Gauss might have gone about solving this problem. And it occurred to me, you know, well, how would I have solved this problem, okay, if I were in Gauss's class? Not, not his class as a mathematician, but his, his school class. And, okay, so there's the problem again. Well, I would have done it this way. I would have taken 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15. I would have just plottingly done it one number at a time, okay? Now, let me not do the whole thing, okay? Let's just do the numbers, one plus two plus three plus four is 10. What it occurred to me was, well, you know, you do that, okay? One, then you add two and you get three, then you add three and you get six, then you add four and you get 10. And then I thought, well, you know, just to make sure because I always make mistakes when I'm doing mathematics. And even simple arithmetic, I make mistakes. One thing that occurs to me is that, you know, it doesn't matter in what order you add numbers. You should always get the same result. And so I'll double check my work by adding the numbers in a different order. And so I'll start with two, and then add three and get five. And then add 4 and get 9, and then add 1 and get 10, and yes, the answer is correct. But what, I, what had occurred to me, in part because I was doing it on purpose, was that along the way, okay, here 
the partial sums that you get along the way are 1, 3, and 6 before you get to 10. Whereas the second way I did it, the partial sums were 2, then 5, then 9, and then finally 10. Okay? But the numbers that I got along the way were completely different. And I thought, huh, I wonder if I can get, an, uh, if I can do it again and get, again, a different set of partial sums before I get to 10. And in this case, yes. If you start with 4, and then add 3, you get 7. And then add 1, you get 8. And then add 2, and you, you again, get, you better get 10, unless you're me and you, you make mistakes. And now I've got 4, 7, and 8. And so I've got all nine partial sums. Partial just means you haven't completed the, the entire, uh, uh, or all the arithmetic. I got them all once and only once. And that's always a really good thing in mathematics, to have stuff once and only once. Okay. So can we do this? You add numbers 1 to 5, which add up to 15. Well, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took me to realize that you can't. The answer is no. <laughs> And the reason is very simple. Each arrangement, you have four partial sums before you get to 15. Okay, you would, you know, the, the natural order would be 1, 3, 6, 10, and then 15. Okay, but there are only 14 partial sums, less than 15. And here's the kicker 4 does not divide, oh shoot, 4 does not divide 14. Sorry, I'm going to fix that right now. <laughs> no, I've get, this is the third time I've give, given this talk, and nobody has corrected that. I heard somebody mutter something, so that should have been 14. Let's even save it. Sorry, sorry about that. I told you I make mistakes. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I'm. I'm Yes, okay. All right, all right. So, okay. How about, okay, you know, I could have stopped there and said, ah, it only works for four, doesn't work for five. And I thought, eh, you know, maybe it'll work for six. Okay, well, and the answer is maybe, if we think about it, each arrangement now gives five partial sums before you get to 21. And there are 20 numbers less than 21. And by golly, 5 really does divide 20. Okay. So what we want now are four different ways to add the numbers 1 to 6. Okay. Each one should give, you know, wind up with 21, but we should get five different partial sums each time we do it. Okay, but can it actually be done? And here again, okay, you got it. Just spend some time and try to do it. But I'm going to tell you the answer is yes, and there it is. Okay. Now, I've just written down the answer. Okay, so I've shown you a solution, not the solution. We'll, we'll get to that. It actually, you know, you actually have to look at it and make sure, again, I've done all the arithmetic correctly. We really do, it's easy to see there actually are five partial sums. And if you scan around, you, it, it, it takes, it, it's, a, it's a job in itself to check that you actually do have each number from 1 to 20 somewhere. You know, again, once and only once. Okay. Question next is if you can do it for 6, well, again, the, 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 the problem with 5 happens for every odd number. So the odd numbers aren't worth looking at. Maybe they are. Maybe there's something going on that you can do with odd numbers that I haven't thought about. Okay. Um, but my inclination here was to just ignore the odd numbers, 
just look at the even numbers where there is a possibility. So can we do it for the numbers 1 to, to 8? In this case, each arrangement will give seven partial sums. You want, you know, there are 35 numbers less than 36, okay? And 7 does divide 35, gives you a quotient of 5. So you're looking for five ways of doing this. And the answer again is yes, but I'm not going to bother showing it because it's just a bunch of numbers. Okay? And you get no, you get very little insight from, from just you know, a glance at a bunch of, of, of numbers. Okay? But if you can do it for 4 and 6 and 8, we'll also come back and do it for 2 in, in, a, in a moment. 0 is an even number that's really easy to do. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the question arises, can you do it for any even number? And now, when you add you know, all the numbers up to an even number, the sum turns out to be 2n plus 1 times n. That was really Gauss's you know, clever insight that, that you can, that, that there's a nice simple formula going on. Um, and I'll say again now, we're looking for n plus 1 rows. Each row has, you know, because you're adding the numbers up to 2n, each row will have 2n minus 1 partial sums. And there's a little bit of algebra that you can, you know, admire on, on the screen. And the, the, the point is, it gives you one less than the actual sum, which is what, what we're, we're looking at. This is an unsolved problem. So if there's one thing I, I do hope those of you who are paying attention, okay, go away from, with, the, from with this talk, is if you're gonna you know, think about any of this stuff, you really wanna remember it, okay, this is the problem to remember because this, I really do think, is, is worth someone thinking about um, because it's, uh, because, the, you know, so far those of us who have spent any time thinking about it have not come up with anything useful. I'm going to tell you what's known. There are solutions. The solutions have been found by computer search for all the even numbers up to 26. And then for some technical reasons, they've started skipping over the multiples of 4 and done the numbers 30, 34, and 38. That was done by a guy named Rob Pratt about eight years ago. Somewhat more recently, just last year in fact, I got contacted by email, uh, a, a student actually in Germany, who's extended the analysis to all the even numbers not divisible by 4. So he, he skipped over and has now done 42, 46, 50, all the way up to 110. Okay? And if you work out the algebra of, of that, okay, um, you know, your hundred, when you add the numbers up to 110, you get something in the 5,000 yeah, range. I, I mean, if you go up to 100, you're getting 50, 50. If you add another thing, so you're, you're getting like 5,500 or something is, is the sum. You wind up with about 50 some rows. So it's a big um, uh, problem just to write down what the, the solution is. Um, what I want to do to, to end with is try to explain why, does, why the computer searches have skipped the multiples of four. And also, why is this thing called the bricklayer's challenge? Because what I've described so far is just, it, it's all numbers. Okay, it's just adding a bunch of, of, of numbers. To, to answer that first, this is where Richard Guy really enters the scene in, in a big way. Um, I, I was visiting him at the University of Calgary in, in Canada, and he saw a geometric interpretation for what I was doing that he likes to call building barricades because he likes plays on, on, on words. What he said to do is picture a solution as a wall of bricks. And so here is that earlier solution uh, for, 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 for the numbers one, 1 to 6. And each row has bricks of length 1, 2, 3, 
up to, in this case, six. Okay, and so you can see it. Well, across the top row, it's got one, two, three, four, five, and, and, and six. It's, it's not obvious that they are you know, actually integer links. Okay. The key is that no two seams are vertically aligned. And here is where the bricklayer comes in. No bricklayer would ever put two bricks, you know, one directly above another so that, you know, the, that there's a, a, you know, a cement seam that, you know, runs vertically down them, okay. But in this case, the master bricklayer doesn't even want a seam up here aligned with the seam down here. And what's going on here is that the seams are the partial sums. That the first seam here, that's the partial sum one. Then you have the partial sum two in this row. Then you have the partial sum three. Then you have the partial sum four. This is a brick, brick of length four. Here is a brick of length five. Then you have a seam at six up here, seven here, eight here, nine here, I hope, and, and so on across. So there's this natural um, uh, uh, interpretation of partial sums as just being where the seams are between uh, horizontally adjacent bricks. Okay. So for n equal two, this is really easy. Okay. There it is. 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 1 is 3, kind of end of story. When we do 4, there's that original thing that I did, adding the numbers 1 to 4 to, to, to get 10. Okay. Turns out there are two more solutions, and they look like this as, as brick walls. You have to actually study these things a bit to see that they really are different and not just you know, of course, if you have a solution, you can permute the, 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 the rows, okay? But, you know, that shouldn't count. And so it's natural to always have the shortest brick, you know, on top and the longest brick on the bottom and just at the left edge go like, like that. Notice, okay, um, you know, one feature, this, the first solution we have has the, the, the natural ordering 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 across the, 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 the top. The other two solutions do not have 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 anywhere in them. So they really are different from, from the, the first solution. And they also differ in essential ways from, from each other. Um, but, but that actually you know, poses its own problem of you know, if there are solutions, how many solutions are there? And, and, and then what do you mean by, you know, solutions being different? How different do they have to be in, in order to, to, to get there? Okay. So, um, for six, here it is. Okay. And there it is in wood, that that's what's back there. Again, the woodwork, I always like showing people my, you know, the wood, these wooden puzzles because people tend to assume that I did the woodwork. I did not. My, uh, Lauren Larson gets all credit for that. Now, let me explain briefly, and then I think we'll, we'll probably stop, why the computer searches took to skipping multiples of four. And it's for a somewhat technical reason that allows the searches to search more efficiently. Because uh, the, 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 the searches just start going down trees and saying, well, let's just try this and see if it works. You know, you just, just start building walls of bricks until you run out of bricks that you need and you're forced to have a seam. And then you undo it and you, you try it again. If, you're, uh, um, if, if you are a computer science major or, or uh, have, have looked at this at all, at sort of thing at all, it's something called depth first search, where you, you just go looking for solutions, okay, but if you get stuck, you come up and try a different branch of the, of the, of the, um, the possibility tree. Um, the idea is what Richard Guy calls rotary barricades. And so I'll do it with a particular solution. Here's a different solution for n equals six. 
And let's duplicate it. So let's have two copies of it. Okay. And now what I want to do is, sort of like with the solve the wit problem, let's rotate one of those copies. So we just rotated a copy, but what happened? It didn't change. Okay, it stayed the same. That is, in general, not true. Most solutions, if you rotate it through 180 degrees, you get something that looks different. But some solutions, the ones that the Richard Guy calls rotary barricades, doesn't they 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 they, they stay the same. And what that means is as you're trying to look for things, what you do is you lay out bricks along here. And if you start to, to think about it, you know you have to have a brick of length one, because you, you have to have a seam. Okay, you have to have a you have to have a seam at each of the possibilities. So you have to have a brick of length one here. And likewise, you've got to have a seam over here. But if you assume or if you specifically look for something with a rotational symmetry, okay, once you put the brick of length one here, you, you, know, you, you're, you put it down here. So you get this constraint happening very quickly. And then you also know you have to have a seam at two. It can't be in the first row, so you might as well put it in the second row. And so when you start building the wall from this end, you're automatically building it from the other end. And so as you're exploring the tree of possibilities, okay, because these things branch quite, quite quickly, okay, because here, okay, well, we, we, in fact, this one does put a three, okay, and so you put a three up here. Down here, you know, we, we, we need something with the seam uh, you know, through here, and we need to put something down here. You, you could have put a brick that went you know, four to pick up that seam, or five, or, or six. So it's like there are only three possibilities. At any rate, the, 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 the tree starts branching, okay? and eventually it starts branching quite wildly, especially if you're doing bigger and bigger and bigger numbers, like up to 110. That you, you get, you, you, know, you just get densely, you get a whole woodsy forest of possibilities, and you need some way to cut through the thicket. Okay? But if you assume that there is a rotationally symmetric thing, then you're building for both ends, and you tend to run into dead ends more quickly, and so you retreat, try something different, and again start building. You, you run into trouble, you retreat, try something different, and hopefully you, you find a solution. And in fact, they, they have for all the numbers up to 110. And they stop at 110 just because at some point the, the computer just gets tired. Um, and and the, the, the trees are growing so, so rapidly that the, the search has to, to stop somewhere. The point is, okay. This rotational symmetry can only occur if there's an even number of rows. If there's an odd number, if there's an odd number of rows, there's some row in the middle, which when you rotate it, stays, you know, it, you know, rotates onto itself. And that cannot be rotationally symmetric because, you know, if you take you know, some bunch of numbers and turn them around, you've got a different, you've got the reverse order on, on there. So that's the reason that you skip over the cases where there's an odd number of rows, okay? And the even number of rows happen to occur for, as we saw, uh, 2, 6, 10, 14, and up to 110. There's no guarantee, to, to begin with, the, the central problem is, at some point, okay, there may not be any solutions at all. Even if there are, there may be solutions, but not rotationally symmetric. So these may not exist, but they do. They, they just do. 
at least up to 110. And when they do, they're, they're easier to find. The, the computational search just goes more, more quickly. And I'm, I'm going to skip over because I've really taken way too long, and unless there's a cry for me to continue. I will. Okay, I'm going to just keep going. All right, we can be here till the morning. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the Fink condition is named after a, a, a student of Richard Guy's named Alex Fink. I, I, I don't know, in English, Fink is kind of a, a, a word for a, a, a rat, somebody who, who's, who does unpleasant things. Who, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a word for someone who betrays you. Okay, but this is, Alex Fink is not that. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I hope Serbia knew that. Uh, not Serbia, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in case you have any concern about, about his name. Um, <clears throat> what, what Alex noticed when Richard put him to work on this is some solutions have a nice property that if you divide them into two n minus one parts, in this case, I'm looking at, at n equal 2, so the number is 1 up to 4, twice, twice 2 is, is 4. If you divide that into thirds, what's happening nicely is each partition has a seam in each row. The second, the middle partition has a seam in each row, and the third partition has a seam in each row. And conversely, each row has a seam in each of the three parts to it. And so that is what uh, Richard uh, Guy called the Fink condition. And it also can help speed up searches, okay? Although I don't think it's, it's been used. So we'll, we'll end with some of these. The central question is, are there solutions for all even numbers? Okay. Any progress on that would be, would be welcome. Then, are there always solutions that satisfy this Fink condition? That's, that would be worth knowing. And are there these rotationally symmetric solutions whenever they're possible, when you have an even number of rows? So, so skipping the multiples of, of, of four. Um, Oh, that should have been a 2n equals 2, 6, 10. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to fix that, too. Finally, how many solutions are there for, for each number? The conjecture the answer to these is, the existential answer is always yes. It's just the solutions exist. And, and whenever they can, you know, uh, uh, have, you know, the different conditions of rotational symmetry or, or the Fink condition they, they do, the number of solutions seems to grow rapidly. Okay? Uh, there are, as I said, the, 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 um, for, for the numbers one to four, it turns out there are three essentially different solutions. When you get to the numbers one to six, the wooden puzzle version, um, depending on, on, on you know, how you distinguish, you know, what, what it means to be a different solution. There are on the order of 2,000 different solutions to the n equals 6 problem. Unfortunately, there is on the order of close to a billion possible ways you can just arrange the bricks. So you're looking for 2,000 needles in a haystack of something like a billion, you know, pieces of, of straw. Okay. So for large values of, of the numbers, we're looking, we are looking for a huge number of needles. We think, okay, we don't know that there are any beyond 110, and we don't even know about the multiples of four after, what is it, 24. Okay. Okay. But the haystack is growing, in some sense, super exponentially, and, and that's the, um, the problem with this. So, if you can remember this problem, please report any progress to, to me if you have a chance, or to Richard Guy, who's still interested in, in the problem. If you find a proof, publish.
question. And I think I will end with, with that because my God, I've spoken okay. way too long. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. If anyone wants to ask the speaker anything what is related to this talk or maybe some other things, uh, you are very welcome during this official part or maybe unofficial part after this. So. Nobody wants yes. now. Or I can keep going. <laughs> 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 that's that's, that's the threat. <laughs>